right, here we go. Everybody see that okay? Uh, a discussion, the 2024 housing market. Uh, we'll start with, you know, what really drives the mortgage industry, and that is mortgage rates. Uh, certainly a topic of the last couple of years and not for good reasons. Uh, where are we at right now? 30-year fixed rates are still in the high sixes, uh, but we are down over a full percent from the highs. And uh, the rest of 2024, rates should trend lower. Uh, also, 5 and 6% 30-year fixed rates will feel much different to prospective home buyers than they did two years ago. Just some of the, you know, hey, rates have been higher now for a long time factor. Also, you have a lot of impatient wannabe home buyers out there uh, that rate will slowly erode and become less of a factor over time. Uh, what is projected from the Federal Reserve this year? Right now, the Fed funds futures markets are, pro are projecting 325 basis point rate reductions for the Fed in 2024. Starting this summer, right now, there's about a 50-50 shot of one at their June meeting priced in. Um, so when will the Fed, when will their lowering start? Still some debate over that. But the projections right now is that we will see three reductions in the Fed funds futures rate this year. What do the experts think about rates? What I did was I just pulled up and went through the latest economic projections for four of the bigger names in our industry, uh, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, NAR, and the MBA. I'm not going to read through all of these, but the essence of what they're all predicting is slowly lower cascading rates from now through the end of the year uh, from their current levels to anywhere between five and a half and six and a half percent, depending on who's projecting it. So, you know, the expectation is that uh, as the Fed wages its battle against inflation uh, and that that will start to have impact, uh, the Fed will lower the federal will, will lower Fed funds rates three times over the course of the year uh, and mortgage rates will kind of come down with it. As, as most of you probably know, there's not a direct correlation between, oh, hey, the Fed's going to lower in June. Uh, that means rates are going to go down in June. That stuff kind of bakes itself into the market in anticipation of that. And as a matter of fact, we saw rates dip, you know, a little earlier this year, like into the low sixes for a period of time. The reason they're back up now near seven is because some of the inflation data that we've seen since then uh, has not been as convincing that the Fed has that battle in their clutches. Um, and, you know, again, we were a lot of people were projecting a few months ago that the Fed would lower at the most recent meeting they just had last week. Obviously, they didn't do that. So why rates have gone up? I mean, a lot of reasons. But the biggest reason is um, the market had priced in about a 60 or 70 percent chance of a Fed rate cut in March at their meeting last week. That obviously didn't happen. And now that that projection has kind of been the can's been kicked down the road to June. So you've seen a little bump up in rate. But just some real talk right now, like what what is likely to happen this year with rates? Just me, my opinion, what could happen? Um, being honest, I think there's two scenarios that could play out this year with interest rates. There's the safe prediction that most people believe in right now that the Fed is generally doing a ju good job combating inflation. We've seen some progress on that front, that they will continue to use all the tools in their arsenal to continue to combat it. It will continue to have the desired effect and rates will slowly come down as that happens throughout the course of the year. The better job the Fed does fighting inflation, the better it's going to be for mortgage rates. So, you know, if you're talking to prospective home buyers, um, you know, it's it's don't look at like, oh, when is the Fed going to lower or is the Fed going to lower? Look at the inflation data. Like next Tuesday, we get a really big one. It's the biggest one. It's CPI. It's called the Consumer Price Index. Um, it essentially is the me measure of the price of everything in America that, cons that, that consumers buy. Uh, it's the number one gauge of inflation. It comes out Tuesday. And it, will rates go up or down after that number comes out? 
it, whether they go up or down, it'll be because of what economists' expectations are of that number. Is the number better, better, lower inflation, Fed doing better job, or worse, higher inflation, Fed more work to do? Uh, that's what is causing movement in interest rates. It right now is all about the inflation data. Uh, there's there's three big ones, CPI, Consumer Price Index, PPI, Producer Price Index, and PCE, which is the personal consumption something. Um, uh, but it's the three main tools that the Fed and economists use to measure inflation. Right behind the inflation data in terms of mortgage rate moving numbers are jobs numbers. Uh, we get a big one this Friday morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, the first Friday, first full Friday business day of every month, we get the employment report from the prior month. The unemployment rate nationally is refreshed. Uh, you know, we also get data on how many new jobs were added to the U.S. economy in the month prior. And uh, it's kind of a, you know, a slippery slope that the Fed is trying to walk here. They want robust employment. Uh, they want a low unemployment rate. They want companies hiring. At the same time, they want companies reducing the cost of their goods a little bit. A lot of times those two things don't go hand in hand, right? Companies hire, 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 and uh, that's more expense. So in theory, they have to raise prices to do that. So the Fed is you know, trying to walk this balance between um, fiscal policies that will be positive for the job and labor market here in America, yet won't lead to runaway inflation. It's really a delicate dance that the Fed is trying to walk. What's the other scenario? The other scenario that you could see play out, I think, that nobody in the room probably wants to hear is the Fed does not do a good job against inflation. Um, you know, there is some data recently that may seem to indicate that the Fed uh, maybe they're not fully incorporating uh, a lot of the shelter related components to inflation strongly enough. Uh, people's uh, mortgage payments go up, right? You have a home equity loan that goes up as rates go up. Um, and there's, if you're more interested in reading more of that, look in my LinkedIn timeline. I've been posting a lot about this lately, just cause it's really interesting to me. Um, but let's just say the fed doesn't do it. Let's just say the, the inflation number is horrible on Tuesday and inflation's higher. You know, what you could see is, um, you know, rates would spike up probably in that scenario. Nothing crazy. I mean, probably, you know, under the seven and a half to high sevens range, if the inflation data is really bad. <laughs> Um, and then the Fed may have to think about, you know, countermeasures to combat that. So another scenario, the, the, the most popular scenario is rates slowly and gradually decrease throughout the course of the year. That's the most likely scenario. If the Fed is ineffective in the battle against inflation, you could see rates spike into the spring and the summer. Uh, you could see that lack of progress on the inflation front start to have impact on other things in the economy like labor like gdp and then the fed like we've seen many many times before in past refinance booms have to go back to the offensive side of the play ball tool book to uh, toolbox uh with rates uh, maybe lowering it more aggressively than they're inclined to right now that could lead to a sharper uh, decline in rates. I think there's two scenarios that play out rates slowly lower throughout the course of the year, or maybe this inflation data that we see in the spring and the summer isn't great. Rates spike. The Fed realizes, hey, we've missed the mark on our battle against inflation. We're going to have to get a little bit more aggressive in our policies, even if it terrifies us. In that scenario, you could see rates spike up and then shoot down a little bit more quickly. Some promising signs, though, here in January, and I know it may not feel like that to all you in this room, but I, I look at data nonstop nationally, existing home sale data up 3.1% in January from December. That's a five-month high. New home sales. So new home sales represent 15% of all listings. Um, those rose 1.5% in January. January. Uh, permits, building permits, so future construction also increased in January. Fannie Mae's monthly home purchase sentiment index, which basically is a consumer survey that measures uh, consumers' willingness and eagerness to buy housing, to buy homes. That rose again in January. That's its highest level now since March of 2022. 
Uh, member times were still pretty good and you know, things were slowing down a little bit. Rates were starting to come up, but uh, it was a fairly healthy climate. So it's another nice barometer. And then the National Association of Home Builders, uh, they release a uh, housing market index, which checks builder sentiment. That rose in February as well, um, much higher than projected. It was supposed to only go up one point. It went up four points um, to its highest level in several months. And again, that's going back to the point I was making earlier. When you're looking at things to, that are going to move markets, it's not the numbers themselves. It's the numbers versus the expectation, the economist's expectation of the numbers. It's really going to move the needle. Some promising, some more promising signs on the inventory front. I'm not sure you guys saw this, but Realtor.com recently came out with a report uh, that report reported that inventory levels continue to rise, a nice spike up in February, and that overall total home listings in America, 14.8% higher than one year ago, which is promising. Because at the same time, the median list price is less than half a percent higher. So, uh, you know, it's not, you know, listings at astronomical prices. You see down below the bottom bullet point as well, 14.6% of listings in February had a price decrease during the month. Uh, last February, that was only 13% of listings saw a price decrease. Um, and then again, looking inside the numbers, the most encouraging aspect of this report to me was first newly listed homes. You know, you would think, oh, okay, hey, listings are up in January. We're past the holidays. People are just listing the same damn homes that uh, they've had listed at unrealistic prices. But no, um, first time listed homes up 11.3% versus last February. So all promising signs. What's the bottom line though? I mean, the bottom line is this, you guys all know this, right? There's a massive underlying demand of people that wanna buy homes in America that are sitting on the damn sidelines for one reason or another, um, you know, related to, you know, inventory levels, you know, the, the homes not being out there, uh, affordability uh, not being there. And, uh, you, but it's, there's just so many people that are sidelined right now, aspiring first time home buyers, uh, current homeowners that want to step up and step down, uh, you know, people that are already own a home, they're sitting at one of these two and a half to three percent rates. They don't want to give it up right now, but they may want a new home at the same price point. They may want to move into a bigger, nicer home. They may be empty nesters. They may want to move down. They're not having to this point, not been quite ready to give up two and a half or three percent for six and a half or seven. Um but we all know how these things work. I mean, people get impatient, right? People have gobs and gobs of equity in their houses too. So that can be a mitigant. Okay, shit, I got to go from 2.6% to 6.8, but I'm also cashing in on $300,000 in equity in my house that I can use for a down payment. Maybe I can use to buy the interest rate down. I can always refinance the rate. I just think you'll see people, you know, even if rates don't go down this year, start to get impatient and want to get in that new home. And then you got the sideline but ready people, the parents basement people, uh, you know, that, you know, would love to be living somewhere else. Maybe don't have to. They're looking for the right opportunity. So there's just so many people that want to buy houses in America right now. There are some headwinds and some mitigants to that for sure. But think about it. Right now we're 27 months into a bear market. I know Hopefully they're serving the alcohol uh, at this point of lunch because that's a long time, 27 months. That's the bad news. The good news is as somebody that's been in this industry for a lifetime, what we know is when we see extended bear markets, we see very, very healthy extended periods for real estate finance. And that is a when, not if scenario. We're going to be headed into a very, very healthy three to five year stretch for housing and housing finance here in America. Will it start this spring? Will it start this fall? Will it start next spring? I don't know. The answer to that largely lies in how effective the Federal Reserve is in combating their efforts to combat inflation um, because rates are the ultimate driver. But whenever this bear market ends, and we are seeing signs of it, all my lender clients I've talked to last two weeks, increased activity, increased applications. Is this the beginning? Coming off some of these January numbers that look pretty good, we'll see. Time will tell. But, uh, you know, the future is is going to be bright after what has been obviously really a couple tough years. And then 
emerging markets present opportunity for those prepared form. You know, I get it. It's been two tough years. It's tough to do all the little things that you need to do to be as successful as humanly possible in your role. Um, you know, the, 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 the drip, 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 the planting seeds, the stuff that is agonizing every day that you don't necessarily want to do, but that is important to your business. Uh, it's been tough to do that stuff these last couple of years. I would argue you should be all in on that stuff right now. <clears throat> uh, some perspective and home buyer talking points. Uh, inventory levels are projected to increase throughout 2024. We saw a big, nice sign of that in February um, as rates fall. And again, don't dismiss the amount of equity people have in their homes. It is significant and powerful. And uh, you know how people think. I mean, look at uh, even though I don't think home values, they're not going to go down anytime soon whatsoever, just because there's so much damn demand and the supply is still challenged. So if you're an existing homeowner bully for you. But I, I do think that the amount of equity that people are compiling will cause a lot of those existing homeowners to finally make a move. That's what we need at the end of the day to really open things up. Low rates obviously would help catalyze that. But even if rates stay the same, if, if more existing homeowners, you know, moved on to their next home and listed that existing one, that would really open things up. <laughs> Uh, that said, the inventory rise will be gradual. Prepare yourself now when opportunities arise. I mean, I got a couple of buddies that are looking for houses right now. Oh, I don't want to pay 7%. I'm like, I wouldn't bank on rates being like 4% at any time soon. Could they go down to six? Yes. Could they go down to five? Yes. Could they go up to eight or eight and a half? Yes. Like you find a damn home you like, buy it because you can always refinance. And there's no way home values are going down anytime soon. It's just the simple laws of supply and demand. Um, Freddie Mac, the main industry source for mortgage rates, has been tracking 30-year fixed rates since 1971. Uh, from 1971 to early this year, the average monthly mortgage rate, 7.74%. So we're at about seven right now. So historically speaking, I, I, I get it. 7% seems unbearable to people. Um, and demand is uh, poised to remain very strong. I kind of alluded to that before, uh, which is great for home values. If you're buying a house right now, yeah, you got to hold your nose and take the 7% rate, but you're buying something that is likely to appreciate in the short term for sure. Um, and again, a lot of times it's if you were a homeowner, you're, you're going to be cashing in on some pretty big equity to, in theory, make a nice down payment. So there we have that. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know, let me get back into the chat to see if there were any questions anybody had, uh, about uh, any of that. Here's a question. Any thoughts on what government can do to increase housing inventory? That's a great question. Cause this is something I'm very passionate about. I, there are a number of things they can do. Um, the easiest thing to me would be to pass some kind of bill. Um, existing owners of investment properties, they're not going to want to reward these corporations that are buying up entire cities of investment properties. But the individual that owns one or two or let's say less than 10 or less than five, whatever number they want to put on it, investment properties, I think, and I've, I've sent this note to my local politician, uh, that uh, Sherrod Brown in Ohio, who sits on the Senate Banking Committee, um, would be do something to incent existing owners of investment properties to sell them to owner occupants. I would say waive or reduce the capital gains tax, right? If you're sitting on investment properties right now, you're sitting on a ton of equity in those things. It's been a good investment. Uh, I can just almost assure you of that. But so why are people not selling right now? Oh, rates are so, you know, values are so high. Um, well, because there's capital gains tax you have to pay on that, number one. Two, they probably think it could go up higher. But if you waive to reduce the capital gains tax for individuals that sell investment properties to owner occupants, to me, this is, I've been talking about this plan for three years. Um, and to me, it makes a lot of sense. Yes, you would be giving up some tax revenue, 
uh, by waiving or reducing the capital gains tax. But I think it would cause a lot, even if you did it for three months, so May 1 to, you know, August 1 of this year. And it's, you know, limited to just people that own less than five. And, you know, the max benefit is X. Even if you put guardrails on it, to me, that would be one great thing you could do. Another thing you could do, if we remember those of you that were in the business in 2017 and 2019, President Obama did a first time home buyer tax credit. You could do the flip flop of that. Do a home buyer, home seller tax credit. Incent people. To, there's, there's one way to get people to do things, incent them financially. It, it's undefeated. <laughs> and, um, you know, this, the, the home first time home buyer tax credit in 17 and 19, the, both were highly successful. Google it if you don't remember it. It was so successful in 17. They did another round in 2019. You could do the same thing for home sellers. So just a couple ideas I have, but who am I? Uh, how do you anticipate the proposed restrictions on hedge funds owning single family homes will affect the market in the short term? Great question. Um, so, you know, I wish this would have been done 10 years ago because we wouldn't have had this problem where all these big corporations just went up and just that's a big part of the inventory problem right now is hedge funds and big corporations anticipating exactly what has happened, astronomical rises to home values, went out and just gobbled up investment properties all over the country. Um, and they're sitting on so many of them right now. And they have no desire to sell them because they're highly profitable. It's monthly cash flow. Uh, it all supersedes the pain and ass of being a landlord. Um, it is, you know, so that's a big part of the existing problem. So almost a little too little too late, um, you know, because right now, you know, hedge funds aren't going to be buying up gobs of invest investment properties today. This said, this restriction makes it tougher, um, but the climate's not as conducive to do it because of just the appreciation you've seen these last three, four years. It's riskier to do it. There's more of a chance that that home will be the same value five years from now than there was two or three years ago. But for the long term, it's good. Um you know, because it will dissuade and make it more difficult for exactly what has happened here in America to happen again. And, you know, you just have the biggest percentage by far of single family homes in America that is owned by non-owner occupant corporate non-individuals. So that, uh, but another great question. So here we go. You guys see it okay? All right. All right. Unleashing the power of LinkedIn and social media to grow your business. All right. Your, your brand and your business. So this is tough. In, inherently, the vast majority of people don't like promoting themselves on social media. Of those that do, most would prefer to do, do it with pictures of their kids and family on Facebook than they would professionally. Right. It's uncomfortable to sell yourself. Um, it's just, you know, it is. So I, I always kind of lead with that. And then I follow with, I hate social media as I get ready to deliver a presentation on it. I don't consume any social media. At LinkedIn, I consume because it, it, I learned from it and it, it's perfect, but I'm not on Facebook. You know, I got one of those profiles. I haven't posted anything since my kids were six, 10 years ago. Uh, I'm not on all these social platforms. I I use social media strategically. And I'm inherently somebody that hates this crap. But then I started to realize the power of it and the impact it could have on my business and working smart instead of hard. Um, and I'll show you a ton of ways to use LinkedIn and social to do that, that it's way less time than other things that are less impactful and, you know, that you can't do from home where you have the ultimate flexibility. Um, the real estate industry lives on LinkedIn. Anybody in this room that is not on LinkedIn and active, hopefully by the end of this presentation, I can convince you to be. I have started four companies that I have not spent a penny on to grow outside of my LinkedIn feed. Um, including, including my consultant, the two businesses I'm running now, my consulting business, 
onward and upward, my sports card business, the Cardboard Jungle. Um, it is leveraging my social media following and platform to grow these businesses. And uh, it is incredibly powerful. I'm going to go through some things that have worked for me. So this is not, you know, somebody saying, hey, do this because people say you should. This is me saying, do this because I've done it and it works. And if you do exactly what I tell you, it will work for you um, as long as you stay consistent with it. Um, social media, it's it's like, I always say, it's like taking your vitamins. It's like taking vitamins and just and eating healthy. You know, you're not going to see any immediate impact of it. But if you don't do it over time, you're going to see the negative impacts of it. Um, and it is important to stay consistent, consistency more than anything. Um, you know, if you if you if you start to really develop uh, a social presence uh, and stick with it for six months or nine months in a year and then go away, like you just you lose momentum. Um, so it is really and it does not take a lot of your time. It's just committing to it, understanding its importance and working it into how you spend time during the day. Uh, and it's free. It's free. It doesn't cost a penny. It is 100% free. What else can you do to promote yourself and your business and your brand that's free? And it's where everybody's attention is. You want to go where people's attention is. Um, the most important thing you can do, and I'm missing a graphic here on the left-hand side. The most important thing you can do on LinkedIn every week, strategically max out your connection requests on LinkedIn every week without fail. I do it every Monday morning. I have my calendar set 9 a.m. to 9.15 a.m. It says max out LinkedIn connections. You can send connection requests to roughly 200 people a week on LinkedIn before they make you stop. So you should, uh, and then once you're connected with them, there's a lot of advantage, a lot of advantages. You can send them direct messages when you post things. In your timeline, you show up in their timeline. <clears throat> LinkedIn's algorithms will make you suggestions and other people would be great for you to connect with uh, that becomes advantageous to you and your network and your business. Um, but, you know, I tell everybody, if you don't have the time or the inclination to, to take an extra couple minutes to use filters to strategically max out your connection request, just go with whoever LinkedIn suggests for you. If you go to LinkedIn and click on my network, it'll say, hey, here's some people that might be good for you to connect with. Uh, and then you scroll down a little bit, hey, here's some other people that live in Wisconsin. And you scroll down a little bit more, hey, here's some people that have a similar title to you. So the first group will be people that LinkedIn thinks it would be wise for you to connect with. The second people is some kind of regional and the third is, okay, we have the same title, realtor, loan originator. Um, so if, if, if you do not, if, even if you just connect with their suggestions, that is way better than nothing and quicker. I would argue if you use filters, um, then there's, you can make it more strategic by, you know, entering more specific geographic locations. You can pick one city and uh, make everybody show up that, you're not connected with and it just calls home to Madison, Wisconsin or Milwaukee, Wisconsin or whatever other city in Wisconsin. So um, it's so important to do this though. Like right now I have, I've been doing this for most of my career. I think I have 20, around 25,000 LinkedIn connections. They cap you at 30,000, but I, the followers are uncapped. So those are people that may be connections of yours that also choose to follow you. And I think I have 25,000 of those as well. So I cannot tell you how powerful it is. I mean, I made some stupid post the other night about like the 10 best beer drinking destinations in America. And I got like 4,000 views. I made some really, what I thought was a smart post about housing inventory in America. A little early, I got like 600. So you never know, but it does, you don't have to only post about work-related things too, because it's boring, especially the climate we've been in the last couple of years. But, uh, and I'll get into some suggestions on ways to populate your timeline in a second. 
But for everybody, if you do nothing else after you listen to this presentation, max out your LinkedIn connection. LinkedIn will tell you, you cannot, you're done. You can't make any more. That's when you know you're done. It is incredibly powerful. Um, beyond that, all right, what's the next lowest hanging fruit behind just taking 11 minutes? That's how long it takes, 11 minutes a week to send 200 connection requests. Like, share, comment, post. Anybody can do this. Even if you're the person that hates the post, I don't know what to post. I've got multiple ideas that I'll throw you in a second on that front. But say, you know, I've heard your suggestions on what to post. I don't care. I hate posting. Um, then do this. Like, it's so easy. Just allocate what I do, like stuff I don't inherently want to do or will easily forget to do. I put it in my Google Calendar. Is it like a meeting, like 15 minutes, like 10 to 10, 15, you know, scroll LinkedIn and like crap, like, and I'll do it. I won't schedule things against it and I'll do it. It's powerful. That is time well spent for a bunch of different reasons. One, it's easy. You just, it's all takes like, um, and it creates a lot of goodwill. The author of the post is going to be like, hey, oh my God, Rich liked my post. How cool. Um, they may not know me. And they'll be like, who's this guy in the Topps baseball t-shirt that liked my post? Oh, I'm going to click on his profile. Oh, wow, he does that? Cool. Um, maybe you're not a connection to theirs. And, oh, this guy liked my post. I'm going to send him a connection request. So it's easy. And it, you know, it also shows up in your timeline. If some people click on your profile, it'll show like, hey, they like this thing. So it's a way to, it's, it's a very easy way to build your own brand. If you're liking things about French bulldogs or wine or whatever the hell else you like, people will say, oh, okay, oh, cool, this person there. Not only are they this, but they love French bulldogs and wine. I really like this person now. Um, so liking is easy. Share, almost as easy. Just hit the share button. You can, you can share without any thoughts. Re it'll just say repost without thoughts. That is just literally two clicks of the mouse. Or you can share with thoughts. Like Tom shared a great column this morning about the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, like, hey, are they going to be late to the party? It was a great column. I saw it in my feed. I could have posted the same column. I love Tom. I want to give Tom a little love. I shared Tom's post with my own thoughts. And so it achieves, it serves different masters there. I give my guy Tom, you know, some extra uh, visibility and love. I show that I respect him as a thought leader by reposting something in my timeline. And I'm able to give a couple sentences of my own thoughts um, and raise some awareness for Tom and Equitable Bank, all in the same vein. So another one, commenting. Not quite as easy as liking and sharing, but not really that hard, right? I, I sometimes will just comment with emojis. People think it's funny, you know? Um, somebody get, lands a new job, I'll do like the boom, the explosion. You're like, you know... Uh, you could do an emoji. You could do, there's a million different things you could do. So, I mean, it has the same effects of liking, but even more. And then the dreaded posting that I know everybody's terrified. And we'll get to that next. <clears throat> All right. I don't know what to post. This is, I think, 12 of about 50 ideas. And I tell people all the time, if you don't know what to post, Google what to post on LinkedIn. You'll find about 40 columns with, you know, like a million great suggestions. And uh, it, there's so much good content out there. You know, whatever it is you don't know how to do, you can find it out in seconds, honestly. So, but here, just a, a couple ideas. Share your listings, pictures of client closings of clients, new homes, positive experiences you're having with customers. If you can get a testimonial, that is gold. Video. My God, you have a great, very happy home buyer, and you know them well enough to go to them and say, "Hey, could you send me a ten-second video? Just, you know, if, there, if if you do nothing else for me, you know, send me a ten-second video on text of, you know, uh, that you had a positive experience with me. Share, you know, and you could easily post that thing to LinkedIn in a second. Uh, so that's very powerful. Special programs, <laughs> products, discounts, niches that uh, you offer." Holidays, events, things coming up. I talk about sports nonstop in my timeline. I'm a huge sports fan. I own a sports card company. 
Um, you know, I'm always looking for what's the next big thing in sports coming up. You know, we got March Madness coming up uh, as a big thing. The Masters, all kinds of fun stuff. MLB opening day. Um, promote and tag partners, referral partners, people you do business with for positive things that they're doing in the marketplace. <clears throat> First time home buyer tips and education, a big one. We know how many aspiring first time home buyers there are out there that are waiting on the sidelines. Um, that is a great op. I would say the opportunity right now for a first time home buyer info education, it's probably never been greater ever because you have so many sidelined first time home buyers that are just waiting for their time, you know? So posting educational, informational things that position positions you as a subject matter expert uh, that also, you know, works to prepare home buyers for when their time comes. Seasonal home maintenance tips, other home ownership stuff, open house flyers, financing programs, um, housing market news and updates. I'm constantly posting that stuff to my timeline. I'm trying to post all the most relevant stuff. So follow me on LinkedIn and look what I'm posting and just post the same stuff. You can you know, post your own link to that column with some commentary. Federal Reserve and interest rate updates is obviously going to get people's attention. It's big time in the news. Uh, it's super, super Main Street issue right now in an election year. Um, so anything relating to Fed, their battle against inflation, interest rate updates, and the last, Chat GPT. Do me a favor. When you get back to your office, go to Chat GPT and say, tell me about the current state of the Milwaukee housing market. You're going to get like two brilliant updated to the second uh, uh, written pieces of analysis on what is going on in the Milwaukee housing market. I cannot tell you how often I and others use chat GPT to create content that you, you can post it as is. I, I would recommend massage it a little bit, you know, change out some of the words, make it feel like your tone if you have a tone or if you want to establish a tone, my tone on LinkedIn, I try to be like real speak, not some nerdy like economist that, you know, citing all these big $3 words and stats, but like really what the hell is going on and to speak in plain terms. So when I use chat GPT to unearth content and info, I'm making my tweaks in that regard. I don't want to sound like a chat robot, you know, you know, but it is, it is an unbelievable tool and not just on the Milwaukee hot, whatever you want to know about, whatever it is that you think would be relevant content. So if it's, if it's, I don't know what to post or I'm not smart enough to post about, or I don't know the local, you know, whatever it is that you want to be your content, you don't even have to know it. <laughs> you just have to know how to ask chat GPT it and to massage the words a little bit. I'm telling you, it's powerful, powerful tool that your, compet your smart competitors are utilizing. And that, that's kind of the bottom line here, right? Like if you want to keep raising the bar for yourself, this all your smartest competitors are doing all this crap, all of it. And if they're not, they'll eventually erode market share. It's that simple. Unless they have just these rock solid holds on business and referral sources that will never go away and it'll never, you know... Um, it's 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 very very important <clears throat> taking it to the next level right so the bottom line the bare minimum expand your network every week i would argue the next step behind that like share comment post if you're terrified of posting post once a day once a business day start there most people will tell you the optimal amount of times to post is three to four times a day spaced apart. There are free social media schedulers. That's what I use. I use one called Zoho Social. I think I pay eight bucks a month for it, actually, because I got like the premium version. 
but I schedule out like 50, 60% of my posts for the week, real time news. And I'm posting into my feed. Obviously I got to wait for the news to come out, right? Friday jobs report, 8.30 AM. It's huge. I can't post about that now. I could post my thoughts about it, uh, but that's a post that my, it's in my calendar about an 8.45 AM Friday, you know, content, jobs number. It's going to be top. Everybody's going to be everybody's top of mind thing. It's going to get a ton of views. I know it, right? It's another beautiful part about the LinkedIn and social media game. You could see what people are viewing. You could see what's working. 2,000 views, 600 views, 30 views, 80 views, three likes, no likes. It's inexact science. But as your sample size grows, it starts to give you intel. Some next level stuff, though, beyond that. Video is so effective, right? If you're uncomfortable posting, you're going to be even more uncomfortable taking a selfie video. Um, so uh, all I can tell you is it's way better and way more effective. And it's easy. It really is. I mean, it's it. Hit record. Whatever it is you want to say, um, if you're out in the market having lunch with a business partner, working with the first time home buyer, you mind if I snap a picture real quick? Like, hey, I'm sitting here with, uh, you know, Susie Q, uh, first time home buyer. We're getting lunch at uh, Champs, uh, talking about uh, their new home. Like, that stuff is powerful. Posts with pictures get way more views, posts with videos get even more. Um, all text posts, again, better than doing nothing. But if you had a picture, better. You had a video, even better than that. Start a podcast. Start a podcast about your local hometown, the housing market there. Interview people, talk to people. It's so easy to get guests. I'm a constant guest on podcasts because I tell everybody, I'll never say no. If any of you start a podcast, I'll be on it 100% for sure takes 15 minutes of my time and I'm helping somebody out and I get myself out there and I'll share it in my timeline. You know, like it, it gives me more content instead of having to think about 15 minutes of what to post. I could do a podcast with somebody. They send me the link. I post it. Hey, I just talked to <clears throat> Wendy at, uh, you know, the equitable bank about, you know, trends in the current housing market. You know, it's free. You don't even need, a fancy microphone, but they're like 80 bucks. That's all you need. <clears throat> um, and it's another powerful way to build your brand. It gives you content to post on your social media feeds as well. Personal stuff. The stuff that gets more views than anything I post are pictures of my stupid dogs. I hate to be one of those people, but, you know, like 6,000 views, like, you know, yeah, I'm in. Like, I don't even like my French bulldog, but I like the results that he produces for me when I post pictures of him uh, on social media. Inspirational quotes, things happening in the news. You know, no, I would argue, no, really, if you talk religion and politics, you're an idiot. Um, but stuff that is, you know, like non, you know, things that are happening that are uplifting um whatever it is i mean there's it doesn't just have to be all stuff about house listings granular email marketing is one of my favorites i have used this in linkedin to build every business i've built um most of you probably have some crm you know that shoots out regular you know marketing emails to people in your database you should absolutely do that you know you should be, of course, you should do that. What I will tell you is a personal email to somebody is going to get opened at five times higher a rate than that email that looks like it's coming from a CRM that looks like marketing. Oh, I don't have time to send 600 emails. Well, if it's the exact same message and you just copy, paste, send, maybe you change out the first name or the company name. Um, again, it takes a little bit more time, but it's, you know, you're, you're going to get better results. It's, you know, y'all know, right? Sales is blood, sweat, and tears. The more time you put into it, the more results you're going to get. But then within that, your the time you spend has to be effective on what are you doing? I would argue all this stuff I've been talking about, incredibly valuable ROI of your time. Because all this stuff doesn't take a long time. Um, 
Next slide. Other take it to the next level stuff. Um, host and promote some sort of virtual or in-person first-time home buyer classes. We just talked about it. Like there's never been more aspiring first-time home buyers, right? You could do it at an equitable bank branch. I'm sure they'd love to host it. You could do it at Champs. You could do it sitting in front of your computer like I am right now and do it virtually and invite people. Dangle some kind of a carrot to get them to attend. You need somebody to come and give a housing market update for 10 minutes as part of it? I'm happy to do it. I love to do that stuff. Um, add some value. Uh, host and promote virtual or in-person lunch and learns. Well, great. Look at it. Equitable Bank, right? Beautiful idea today. Uh, happy hour. You know, nothing works better than free beverages. Uh, I'll just say it's, you know, and it's just good juju, right? It's uh, who likes, who who doesn't like a good free drink and all the uh, conversation and banner that, uh, that comes with it. So just make sure it's RESPA compliant. <laughs> Um, and don't abandon or start writing handwritten notes. The more E the world goes, the less people that do that and the more value for those of us that still do it. So don't just because, you know, you're going to adopt a more proactive approach on LinkedIn and social media. Don't abandon things we know works. We know the handwritten note works. We know it works. It's proven time and time again. It is by far worth the time it takes to write it in the stamp. I could tell you a hundred percent for sure. Um, so don't do, don't stop that. If you're not doing it, start doing it and, and supplement all this stuff that we talked about with that. This first most important thing I led with is expanding your network every week by 200 people. You'll start to see why that is powerful. You're probably like, why does he keep talking about this? You'll just start to see if you connect with 200 people every week, like 80 will immediately accept it. And then and 50 or 40 probably never will. And then 10, the other 80, 10 a week will on average for the next 10 weeks. So it just builds upon itself. So somebody like me that does this every single Monday, I'm just getting new connection requests every single day, tens of them. And like 30% of those people are viewing my profile. It's the ultimate thing I want. Oh my God, this guy's got a consulting business. He's got a sports card business. How cool. I'd like to chat with this guy. Um, it's the, That's the most important thing. The second most important thing is trust the process, develop a plan and hold yourself accountable. If you, you know how most things work, right? You'll leave here. Everybody's going to be all lathered up. Oh, this is great. I'm going to be a LinkedIn wizard now. By next Thursday, half of you will have completely quit. I hate to be so brutally honest, but it's just the truth. Don't be one of those people. Don't be one of them. Stick to it. Develop a plan because it's not hard. It's free and easy. You waste time on stupid crap. Just replace that with this. Think about time in your day that is ineffective or inefficient. And just replace it with this. If you have no more time to give to anything, replace something you're doing with this. Social media schedulers, Google free social media scheduler. They're easy. You can preload on Monday morning all your posts for the week. You could take one or two hours Monday morning and sell all your posts for the week. It's done. You get a little notification. Hey, I went live. Your post went live. And you start checking it for likes, you know. Walk before you run. Know yourself. Know what's realistic. I'm sitting here saying everybody should post three to four times a day to LinkedIn and, and other platforms. So one of the beauties of the scheduler, you could post the same post to, like if you look at my Cardboard Jungle social feeds, I'm po posting the same post to six different social platforms at one time without just typing it into one scheduler. But... Um, start with what is realistic for you. If one post on LinkedIn, a business day is all realistically you think you can do, start there. And, you know, when the time is ready, say, okay, I want to get to two a day on business days. And now I want to be two a day, seven days a week. Um, don't overthink it. 
Copy other successful people, what they do. I tell people that all the time. If you're on LinkedIn, you probably have people in your timeline regularly that you kind of respect. Like, oh, hey, this guy or gal, they're great. I like what they post. It's insightful. Their LinkedIn's algorithms are very good at showing you what you want. Copy what other people are doing. Take a look at somebody who you think is good on LinkedIn. Go to their profile, click on their posts, and spend five minutes analyzing their posts for the last week. Oh, he did this. That's a good idea. I'm going to do that. Or she did this. That's a good idea. She shared this information. Why would I not do that? Um, lather, rinse, repeat, and the results will follow. Make it part of your professional DNA. The results at the beginning, don't get frustrated. Everybody starts with zero followers. You're going to start posting crap. You're going to get zero views. You're going to get, you're going to get zero likes and like next to no views. Don't even get caught up in it. Trust the process. It will grow. If you keep growing your network and you keep posting relevant things, again, chat GPT, sharing news columns, promoting, you don't even, you don't really even have to produce any real thoughts from your own brain if you don't want to. I would argue that stuff will always perform better, but you don't even have to. You, I just said it, three things you could do without even thinking. You don't even need to know anything. Outside of how to use ask ChatGPT a question, how to share a news link, or how to promote somebody that's in your network that is meaningful to you. So uh, that's it. So trust the process. And that is the end of that presentation. And uh, I'm sorry that the graphics were so small at the beginning. Sorry, I wasn't looking at the chat. So hopefully um, you guys got all that in. Um, the Equitable Bank crew has this presentation. I've told them, forward this to everybody. You could forward it to whoever you want. I, I just want to, you know, I'm all about anything I could do to lift people up, pay it forward. Uh, so feel free to share the presentation uh, with anyone. So. Mm -hmm.